Okay, yes, it's a recording. There are uh, people in the waiting room. If you can uh, ask the student to help me with this, and then we go back. Uh, okay. Again, a second. I want to do what I want to. All right. Okay, yes, we are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. The okay. stage is yours. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to just add, um, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation and uh, the very complimentary words from, from, from both of you and from Giuseppe. But I'd like to add one thing that I learned, uh, which is really from Giuseppe when he was a student in our group. And that was, he came with a, a, a good idea and I didn't think it was such a good idea at the time. But uh, luckily for, for me, we said, well, if you think it's such a good idea, let's go with it. And the paper that was published because Giuseppe insisted that this and believed in what he wanted to do in the experiment is that maybe the third or something most cited paper I've ever published out of these 300 plus papers. And so the lesson that I learned as an advisor or a supervisor is that listen very carefully to what your students say and what they're thinking and be humble about the fact that, that the more you know, the more difficult, the more set you are in your ways and uh, the more difficult it is for you to uh, get new ideas and accept new ideas. And that's something that I learned from Giuseppe very early on and it has really helped me a lot in my career. So, um, the this, the lecture that I want to give today um, is about pteropods. I'll explain what they are, but I want to put it into a broader perspective of oceanography. And um, so let's move to the second slide. Um, this, this slide I chose to present a uh, is from a very old paper in 1966, a paper that was published by Peterson. And he did an experiment which uh, really was amazing. He took um, calcium carbonate and he made these beautiful spheres that he after. He suspended 71 um, containers with these spheres into the deep ocean down to a depth of five kilometers, 5,000 meters. And they were separated at equal depths. And he left them there for about four months. And then he pulled up the, the, whole, um, the, the, the whole cable and took out the spheres, washed them and dried them, and he, and he weighed them again. And he, what's plotted on the right-hand side against depth in the oceans is loss of weight. And well, the result has really changed our view, I think, of the whole calcium carbonate budget in the, in the ocean. Because what he found was that for the upper 3,000, 3,500 meters, these calcite spheres hardly lost any weight which means that the water in the, in the oceans, the seawater is saturated or close to saturated with respect to calcium carbonate or to calcite, which, um, and then at about 3,500 meters, they started dissolving very rapidly. And that means or indicated that the water is undersaturated with respect to this calcite mineral. And, this transition from saturation to undersaturation is called the calcium carbonate compensation depth. I don't know, has anybody heard about that or do people know about that? <laughs> um, so the, many questions arose from this, um, 
from this experiment. So let's go to the next slide. And you can see on the right hand side where I've written uh, one question is which organisms produce calcium carbonates in the surface waters? And then the question is, will their shells dissolve as they fall to the bottom of the ocean? In other words, how long will it take them to dissolve? He had the spheres there for four months, but how long does it take for these um, biologically produced uh, crystals of, of calcium carbonate to fall through kilometers of ocean and will they dissolve as they're falling down or will they reach the bottom of the sediments and dissolve in the sediments or will they be preserved in the sediments? Those are the most fundamental questions when it comes to seawater chemistry and also what is recorded in the sediments of the deep ocean. And one of the questions that I want to address today is, is whether or not biologically produced calcium carbonate is the same as the geological equivalent um, cal calcium carbonate that Peterson used in his experiment. And this is a, something which Peterson, I, I bet, never even imagined whether there is a difference because he would have assumed, and many people since then assumed, that calcite is calcite, and that's, what there, that's all there is to it. So if we go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll just make sure that we're always on the same slide because I don't see your slides. So this is entitled Major Producers of Calcium Carbonate in the Surface Waters. So to answer the first question that came up with Peterson's experiment, we can uh, ask, which organism? So, Steve, yeah. Steve, I have, a, I, have a, I have a question. The the calcium carbonate of the previous expert was a bi biological produce or was a, or was no no a, it was it, there were perfect single crystals of geological okay. calcite. Okay. So I also suggest the student to to make question if if you yeah. do if you agree. Yeah. Yeah, please do. I really encourage you because otherwise I have no idea what's, whether you're following me or not. Okay, so if we go back to the slide, <clears throat> you probably all know that <clears throat> the major producers of calcium carbonate in the surface waters are the coccolith of Forida, the coccoliths, which you see in the, in the, in, in the photograph, the foraminifera, um, the coccoliths are calcareous algae, the foraminifera are protozoans, and then there's another group of dinoflagellates, which are very abundant, but when they go into a resting stage, they produce a, a cyst of, that has, is mineralized, that has calcium carbonate. So all three, these three major producers, they all make calcite, and, in the, and soon I'm going to explain what's the diff, what is calcite and what is the, the aragonite, because the, the pteropods, the subject of this lecture, they form shells of aragonite. And you can see a photograph of a pteropod, and I'll show you many more. And these are actually gastropods or snails. So unlike the calcite producers, which are single-celled organisms, these are, of course, snails, multicellular, and they produce aragonite, but they're in huge abundant, they're also in hugely abundant in the surface waters throughout all the oceans in the world. So if we go to the next slide, let me say, talk just briefly about calcite and aragonite. These are both calcium carbonates, CaCO3, but they're atoms are arranged in slightly different ways. The black circles are the calcium ions, and the, um, the blue um, circles are the oxygen and of, the of the carbonate. And you can see that in calcite, the, and, and aragonite, the calcium ions are in almost the identical locations in the crystal lattice. But the carbonate ions are arranged in planes in calcite, 
and they're slightly offset in the plane in aragonite. So it's a minute, very small difference. But the difference means, this slight difference means that aragonite is less stable than calcite. And when I say stable, um, when you go to thermodynamics, stability following the first law of thermodynamics is equivalent or correlates with solubility. So if it's less stable, it means it's more soluble. So when we're comparing calcite and aragonite in the seawater, we will expect aragonite to dissolve more easily than calcite. Okay? So let's go to the next slide. And now we're going to focus on pteropods. They're very beautiful um, animals. They're in the, their, their size is about a millimeter range. The biggest, I think, is about six millimeters. And um, they, their whole life cycle is in the surface oceans. So they're always swimming. That's why we call them nectonic, gastropods, snails. And um, we see here two groups. On the left-hand side is a limetina, or in, and you can see it has the characteristic coiled shell of all gastropods that we're familiar with from our gardens or, 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 or the seashore or whatever. But on the right-hand side, the shell <coughs> is not coiled. And it's, in this case, it has a totally fanning type of opening um, structure. And it is quite different. So this divides the pteropods into two very large, different taxonomic groups. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, a little bit more information on pteropods. The two groups are the cavalinoida, those are the, the open ones, and the coiled ones are the limitsinoida. Now, the name pteropod is derived from the fact that the, the foot of the snail that we know of familiar over evolution is, has split and it is divided into two parts and the, the pteropods use these two parts as um, swimming wings and when you see them swimming they're actually moving this like uh, like fish move their their flippers or their their fins and they're very thin just they're up to about 10 microns thick, these shells. In other words, they're very lightweight because they have to swim in all day, I presume, and stay afloat. And um, I told you their size and the different taxonomic groups. So if we go to the next slide, what about their shell structures? So the, the limitsinida, the limitsina, has, a, has a, a shell structure which is called cross lamella structure. And this structure is the most abundant shell structure for all snails, land snails, freshwater snails, marine snails. It's been very well characterized and uh, it's very well known. And the schematic shows the the individual crystal, the third order crystal, they're very thin, very small elongated crystals of aragonite. And then they're organized in parallel arrays. And then the different arrays are arranged in different orientations. And, um, and this gives you what's called cross lamella structure. However, if you look at the cavalinids in the bottom photograph, which is a scanning electron microscope uh, fracture of one particular shell, you can see that it is also has thin crystals, very elongated. But what's quite different is that they're arranged in arrays that are curved. And this structure, um, the curved structure, is unique to this group of, um, of pteropods. It is not found in any other mollusks. And all the mollusk shell structures, by the way, were identified already by 1930. And this structure is the last remaining structure that is, in my, in our opinion, this is, I say, Leah and myself, 
the student that carried out this work, her name is Odelia Nevo, who's just completed her PhD, um, has never been really resolved. So that one of the questions that we're going to address is what is the structure in three dimensions of this shell? So the next slide. The other open question that we want to address and I'm going to talk about in my presentation is um, how well ordered or is, are the crystals of aragonite in the pteropods? And this is become, has become a very important question in all of bio, the field of biomineralization or biologically formed minerals, because we have learned over the last 50 years that most organisms that produce minerals don't precipitate them out of solution um, as like you would in a geological solution. You have a saturated solution, the crystals precipitate, and grow from a saturated solution. Biology has chosen a different route, and that is to first form a highly disordered uh, mineral phase, which is almost like a, a paste, like toothpaste. It has that sort of, but it can be molded into any shape. And what biology does is it produces this very disordered phase, and then it induces this phase to crystallize and become hard and insoluble. And um, the, the first example of this was, was a study that was already done in 1967 by Tao and Lowenstam. Lowenstam was my advisor and the guy that, my PhD advisor, and the person I wrote uh, that book with, that Giuseppe mentioned. And there they have the, these chitons, which are intertidal mollusks, um, have teeth that they use to scrape the substrate, the rock. And uh, those teeth are capped with an iron oxide mineral called magnetite, the same, the, the same crystal that has magnet, that orients in the magnetic field. And they showed, Tau and Lowenstam, that the magnetite or the, the first precipitate is a highly hydrated, disordered ferry hydride phase that crystallizes into magnetite. The insides of their teeth, the inner layer, is composed of calcium phosphate, the same mineral that bone is composed of. And in 1985, Lowenstam and I used infrared spectroscopy to show that that calcium phosphate phase is first precipitated as amorphous calcium phosphate and then crystallizes into the, the, the mineral, which is, as I said, the same crystalline mineral as in bone. And then nobody paid much attention to these two papers and to the whole phenomenon of uh, precursor phases, mineral, what's uh, the stages of mineralization. And I think that the study that we, Leah Dadi and I, and then at that time, Ilya Beniash was a PhD student in our group. We studied the sea urchin larvae, which they have, which you see on the second uh, image. And they have a skeleton made of calcite, beautiful single crystal of two single crystals of calcite. But when they first form this mineral phase, we showed that they produce amorphous calcium carbonate. And then people started paying attention to, to this phenomenon because uh, calcium carbonate is so much more abundant. And instead of thinking that the chitons that I talked about earlier are the exceptions to the rule, the, the rule itself is that, that we now know um, is that biological process of mineral formation occurs through these precursor phases and including mollusks. And the first example of a mollusk um, shell that was produced through amorphous calcium carbonate, a mollusk larval shells, which we published in 2002. So all this is to say, what is the, what is the process of formation of the aragonite of the pteropods? So that's the second question that I want to address um, in this presentation. So if we go to the next slide, can I ask a question? 
Yeah, great. But uh, how did you manage to show such a behavior, such a phenomenon like that? Uh, there is first uh, a deformation of uh, a disorder phase and then of an order phase. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it in great detail uh, for the pteropods, because then, then you'll see that but you can you can um, you need some sort of uh, spectroscopy, either X-ray diffraction or infrared or Raman spectroscopy, uh, in which you characterize how well ordered or, or poorly ordered the material is. But because it's transient, it doesn't last for sometimes more than seconds or minutes or hours. You really have to get used to working with, with a li living animals. And to be able to do this experiment um, on the living animal and catch the first formed phase, and it's really, really challenging. Um, even if, you, if, you, if the animal died, it can continue to crystallize. And even if you go a few hours, analyze it a few hours later, it might be a crystalline, but whereas during the process of formation, it was amorphous. So yes, it's not a trivial thing. And it's no, not a surprise that people missed this over the years. The Lowenstam and, and Tau were very lucky because in the chitin, not lucky there, Lowenstam had great insight. In the, in the chitin, the teeth are formed continuously and every row of teeth, there are about 100 rows, and every row of teeth represents about 24 hours of tooth formation. So there, nature was very kind to them and divided the stages of formation naturally into rows of teeth. Okay, does that answer the question? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to address two questions with regard to the pteropods. What is the three-dimensional structure of these curved arrays of elongated crystals in the cavalinids? And does the cav do the cavalinids form their crystalline aragonites through a disordered precursor phase. And a third question, which is most important for um, seawater chemistry, is does the adult shell aragonite of the pteropods have the same solubility as geological aragonite? Okay, so now let's proceed to the next slide. And the, the literature on the shell structures of the cavalinids is is remarkably small. In fact, there have only been about five or six papers published. And the first paper that was published was in 1972 by Alan Bay, a foraminifera expert. And he proposed that these curved structures that you're seeing, or curved arrays, were helical. They're like DNA, but it's arranged in a helix. And the other five or six papers that have since been published, with the last one being, I think, in 2015, um, have all agreed with Bay and said, yeah, the structure is helical, and they've tried to refine our understanding of the helical structure. And for me, it's always been a question mark. How can you arrange helices, which are sort of turning around on themselves, around an axis, into a structure that is, has, no, has no holes in it. I mean, you, I just con couldn't conceive of how you can pack helices in a way that is space filling, that fills up the whole structure. And so I always had this feeling of a, a, that it, maybe this was wrong um, and that we should really check it again. But, and I'll come and I'll come back to that. Next slide. So the um, the species that we worked with um, both for to address all these questions is just called Chryseus um, acicula, and it's uh, present in great abundance in the Red Sea, and we can catch these alive in the Red Sea. If we go to, there, you can see there have long elongated crystals, uh, shells. And at the edge, at the lower corner, is the protoconch, the, the shell that's formed 
uh, at the very first stage of, of their development. So that's the oldest part of the shell. And then it elongates, the cone just elongates at the growing edge. So if we go to the next slide, here you can see our images, but in all those five papers, everybody published images from the scanning electron microscope of what the shell really looks like. And I think you can see from the left-hand um, photograph, which is, in my opinion, spectacularly beautiful, why Alan Bay and everybody else thought that this must be helical, because these arrays of aragonite crystals just keep turning, it seems. And, but nobody, including ourselves, had ever documented a complete helical turn. It was always a fracture surface or part of the structure, and it was extrapolated or assumed that it was helical. Um, you can also see that at high magnification on the right-hand side, all these crystals are actually sort of interlinked. They grow into each other to form a space-filling structure. There just are no holes in the structure. And you can also imagine why the structure is so tough, why it's difficult to break it, because they're all intergrown like this. So it's a really special, I think one of the most beautiful biological structures that I've ever seen. But I emphasize nobody ever saw a complete helical structure. And when we tried to reproduce what the others had done using scanning microscopy, X-ray or X-ray diffraction, um, we were not able to, to really understand the structure. And we had, so we realized that we really need a three-dimensional analysis of the structure in order to find out what it is. So if we go to the next slide, this is the way um, we went about getting the three, obtaining the three-dimensional structure. And this is one of our favorite instruments right now, and it is called a FIB-SEM. Has anybody heard of this instrument? Yes, no? No. 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 All right, so this is, this is a, a, a fantastic, it's not a new instrument, it's been around for the last uh, 20 years, but used for various purposes. But basically what it does, it is able to slice through almost anything, including a metal, if you want to, with a heavy iron beam that it's sh shot onto or, or, is, or is focused onto the object. And then it has an electron beam which images. So it's a, it, that's why it's called a focused iron beam scanning electron microscope. So it's, and what the, the, the reason why we have a picture of somebody slicing bread is that is, that's exactly how we use this machine. The heavy iron beam cuts the bread or slices the subject, the object, and the electron beam images the newly exposed surface. And you, you can repeat this automatically every, about a cycle is about, a, takes about a minute. And so overnight, if you run the machine, you can produce a thousand images or more, depending upon the, the conditions you set. And then you digitally align all these thousands or hundreds or thousands of images into a three-dimensional stack. And then you can digitally cut the stack in any direction that you like. So we use it now um, and have been using, I think we were the first to start using it for, uh, no, not the first, but uh, we've been using it for about 10 years at the Weizmann Institute to reconstruct the structures of bone, for example, um, uh, various shells, and, um, and so on. You can also freeze your sample and study not only the mineral phase, but you can also study the cells and the, the, the matrix and, and, and with the water and do this as a cryo fibsem, something which uh, we do all the time using this instrument called the crossbeam. The trouble, and that's why that, or the reason why 
and nobody, including ourselves, ever thought that it would be possible to image a mollusk shell structure, is that there's only a less than one percent in case of the um, of the pteropod, less than 0.01 percent, I think, of organic matter. So where's the contrast going to come from? We had no idea, but we figured, let's try and let's try. If if possible, we'll try and stain it or not. And what we got was shown shown on the next slide. Oops. This was the first image that we got when we put a pteropod shell into the into the fib them. And to our amazement, not doing anything to the shell, we could see the outlines of these curved arrays of ar aragonite crystals. You can see them all? Yeah. And so yeah. this was yeah, so this, this was the beginning, and we were really excited. The quality is pretty pathetic or poor. We were used to much better quality, but when you don't expect anything and you, you realize that you're actually imaging something, then we knew that we could only improve it. So it doesn't look good in this state, but it does work. So that's why I said FibSem, it actually works for the pteropod shell. So if we go to the next slide, Here's a, a view of the stack of about, I think it's about 600 images and um, all stacked together in a three dimensional array. And we can turn that, we can now cut that array in any direction that we like and try to understand the structure. So what I'm going to show you now is a video through these 600 images I'm going from the outer shell surface, which is the top of this cube, through to the inner shell surface, uh, which is the bottom of this cube. Okay, so if, um, Stefano, you'll have to press on if you, can you see the um, the bar that shows where the, the video is? Yes. Move, so press on the, um, on the arrow, and then you can see, it, you can see it moving? Yes. All right. So now we've rotated the cube and we'll see now what we image from the top to the bottom. And you can see these arrays are changing directions very regularly. Okay. So now we're going from, through the shell and we're seeing the arrangement. And the question is whether this is a helical organization or not. All right. Um, yes. So you, that was, that was, I mean, we now have three dimensional information and the question is what's going on here? So let's go to the next slide and, and then cut it. Steve, Start. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Um, how big can be the sample? Oh yeah, right. The, the sample, um, the, the, cube, the dimensions of this cube, in this case, is about 10 microns by 10 microns, and the depth is about uh, 4 microns. Oh. Okay? But you can make it bigger. You can make it uh, tens of microns and then lose resolution or have the machine operate the machine continuously for a week, which is not practical. Yeah. And the, re the, resolution that, the resolution that you can obtain is up to about five nanometers. So the volume is 10 microns, but the resolution can be up to about five nanometers. In other words, you can make slices of five nanometers. So that's extremely powerful. So it's called large volume imaging at high resolution. Okay. So let's go to, yeah. the, let's go to the slide which says longitudinal plane. And here we're going to slice through this front face. The longitudinal plane is the plane from the from the growing edge to the tip of the shell. And so, Stefano, if you can operate the um, the video again, then you'll see the longitudinal plane. And now you see, as we go through the longitudinal plane, the structure doesn't change. 
So there's something that wouldn't be the case if this was a, a helix looked at from the side now. Before we were looking at a helix from the, if it was a helix, we were looking at it from the top. Now we're looking at it from the side. So that's confusing. And we can use, the, we can do the third side direction as well, but you also don't see any change. So something doesn't add up. What also frustrated us was, was that when you look carefully at these images, even if you process them, enhance contrast, uh, edge enhancement, whatever you want to do, uh, you cannot trace one crystal through the, the plane continuously. So we said something else is going on. And then Odelia, who's, who did the research, had the idea that maybe what we, what's, we need to do is look for an oblique plane, not a plane which is parallel to the outer surface or the inner surface, but maybe the structure is oblique to these surfaces. So if we go to the next slide. Um, well, I just said what I, I wrote there, what, we, what I, we're going to do. So we go to the next slide. And there, here is the slide where Odelia cut the shell through an oblique plane, okay? Uh, excuse me, uh, yeah. Stefano, I think we missed the first uh, uh, video. I think it's three of them, and we saw the longitudinal and the oblique one, and we missed no, the first we didn't. one. I didn't, there no. were two of them only. There's oblique, yeah. and, then, and then there right. is the slide. No, th we have, the first video was from the top to the bottom, the second was from the side, the longitudinal, and now I'm going to show the third video. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the slide before this one, Stefano. That's. Uh, yeah, that's also. This. Is, is this also a video? Yes, we saw this. Okay. Okay, so now we're on the third video, which the title is Oblique Plane. Yes. Okay, so let's let's run the third video. The Oblique Plane. Oblique plane. It doesn't move for a few minutes, for a few seconds, and now it starts okay. exposing an oblique plane. And and here you can see very beautifully the arrays of the crystals. And in and you can almost trace individual crystals throughout throughout the section. Odelia had to play with many different oblique planes before she got this result. So maybe Stefan, I'll show it again because this is the this is the answer to the structure. Our okay, the, the oblique plane we saw it. Yeah, so show the oblique plane twice. Okay, just just so that people can see and and get an idea. You can see how the oblique plane. It's about twenty degrees to the outer surface there, the top of the cube, and so you can see a curved structure that. Um, is revealed. Now we're going back. Yes. So you can see the power of this method to, to resolve a three-dimensional structure. So let's go to let's go to the next um, slide. Uh, well, there's a there's a title here that in sense what we have is a continuous S-shaped structure. That's what we're seeing in this slide. Now if we go to the next one which shows a, a magnified view of this oblique plane. You have that, Stefano? Yes. So what you see at the top is well known. It's a thin outer layer which which people have documented of prisms of, of crystals, which is very, very thin. It's about a quarter of a micron. And then you see where the red line is tracing this, uh, this one S-shaped crystal. And in two dimensions, what we have, what we're seeing here is an, an, an array of S-shaped crystals all stacked together to form a two-dimensional plane. And it's about 20 degrees um, offset from the, from the surface. So let's go to the next slide. And, you know, with, with images, you can play around with everything, and this is just a different way to enhance them. But the more you play with them, the more you, you feel, we feel at least, unsure that we haven't changed something. But this, 
again gives you the same view of the oblique plane after we've done a lot of image processing. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, sorry, click it. Okay, then click the first one. And this is a schematic of one S-shaped crystal as we as we envisaged it. Okay, now click the next one. Yes. Then, then if we put four or five of them together in a two-dimensional plane, it looks like that. Click it again. Then you can yes. stack these arrays on top of each other. Um, and you have what you see in, in image C, mm -hmm. and then click it again, and we, we um, have the, the rectangle amplified again, and you can see the schematic, how close it comes to revealing what we saw in the scanning electron microscope um, with all the interlocking crystals. So, so we think that this is the basic structure of the Kavalinit um, pteropod. And there is no helical structure at all in this, but it's, these, it's composed of these nested arrays of elongated or um, crystals. Okay, are there any questions about that? Okay. So let's go to the next slide. And just to go back to look at that first scanning microscope, which happened to break the shell in different orientations, in the inset, you could see where we would think the uh, a single crystal, how it would curve at an angle to the outer surface, OS. So that's trying to relate it back to what we what everybody's seen in the in the um, scanning electron microscope. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that. Uh, three-dimensional structure in mind, you can stare at this picture forever and you'll never figure out really what's going on. Um, so that's, that's really, yeah, so that shows um, is the example, the, the end of part one, which is the structure of um, these pteropods, which are the most abundant, I think, of all the pteropods, of the two different groups. Okay, now if, before I go to part two about the mineral phase, um, does anybody have a question or would like to ask? Steve can ask a question. Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, did, you, did you perform some low angle X-ray diffraction? Yeah, that's, we, we did. And it's incredibly frustrating because in almost any direction, it all looks, it all looks the same. If you, if you have the diffraction being perpendicular to the shell surface, the C-axis is more prominent because the C-axis do come out, um, are, are more or less perpendicular to the shell surface. But in every other direction, the diffraction patterns look like, almost like a powder pattern. So yeah, it didn't help at all to do X-ray diffraction. That was, we, we did a lot of that and others have also done that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a question I would have expected from you, enthusiast for X-ray diffraction, like us. Okay, so let's, let's go to the next uh, part two of this, the formation of the mineral phase. And here we were using the same species, Criseus acicula. Um, and we remind you of the shape and that the shell elongates by at the growing edge. And so um, if you want to study the stages of formation of the, of the shell, then you really want to focus on the growing edge. Uh, because the oldest mineral, the first formed shell is the protoconch, and then the last formed is the growing edge. And if you look carefully, you can see that when the, when the animal goes, it develops from a larvae to an adult, you can actually see it has a slightly different shell structure. And you can see that in the bottom picture. So let's go to the next um, slide. Uh, well, it says pteropod shells grow and thicken throughout the animal's life. Let's go on to the next slide. And here again, you see 
these beautiful, a beautiful picture of the scanning electron microscope. And what we did in this study, which was published already in, in um, 2019, is we used Raman spectroscopy to study the, the shell as it's growing. And Raman has the advantage that it is a micro spectroscopy. In other words, the, 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 the spectrum is obtained through a confocal microscope. So we can obtain um, in structural information from very specific areas of about a, a micron or a few microns in volume. So Raman spectroscopy is extremely powerful in this respect. And that's what we used. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and if we um, did the, the first experiment and find out once we've captured the, um, the, the animal, um, is it growing or while after we've captured it? And so we did an ex a simple experiment and kept it alive for a few hours, or we can keep it alive for a few days, and we put calcium, which is a calcium stain, uh, that's fluorescence, into the water. And we could see, yeah, at the growing edge, um, it precipitated, uh, it formed some newly formed shell. So we knew we could perform the experiment and study very recently, hours old um, shell using Raman spectroscopy. So let's go to the next slide. Hold on, I think we might, um, wow, I think I'm looking at an older version. Did you see a slide with um, with a picture of a lot on it, uh, Stefano? No, you didn't. Stefano? Uh, yes, sorry, I have a switch off the mic. I see shell macrostructure. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, all right, I skipped uh, I, I, in the newer version. that I did. I sent you an older version, but I wanted to, I had a slide to point out something which, was, which uh, I thought would interest you. And that is that we obtained these pteropods um, from Elat on the Red Sea, at the end of the, the Gulf of Aqaba at the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And um, this was the key to, to making this study because we needed to have these animals alive and then to be able to bring them uh, to the Weizmann Institute in order to do the Raman spectroscopy. But if you think about it, these are deep sea animals. They're living out in the ocean, not next to the coast. And so how, if, you kept, if you go out on a cruise and you capture them, you have to get back to the lab where you have a a Raman um, instrument uh, very quickly. However, in Elat, what we have is deep sea right opposite the marine lab. Yes. You, can go, you can go out in a simple motor a motorboat for 10 minutes and the, 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 the depth of the water drops to greater than 500 meters within 10 minutes because it's a fault bound um, um, sea. So a lot has this unique advantage, um, not the only place in the world, but at least it's one place that's close to us, where we can do plankton tows and collect deep sea um, uh, organisms living in the in the, the surface of the ocean. Foraminifera, coccolis, dinoflagellates, all the major producers and many pteropods. And then we're back in the lab within uh, 10 minutes or an hour after we've done the plankton tow. And then we can uh, fly back to the Weizmann Institute. And on the same day, we can do the experiment in the Rama. And that's what Idelia did. It's a long day. You start in the morning on the sea, and in the afternoon, you're in the Raman microscope and she managed to keep them alive for two days or three days. And so she had a little bit of, of, of time. So this was a really challenging aspect of this uh, study. 
So now let's go back to, to what we saw. So what you're seeing now is a, um, a view of the a scanning electron microscope image at very high resolution. Note that the scale bar is 100 nanometers of the form of the growing edge of the exact forming tip. And um, you can see um, on the, in the figure A, on the right hand side is the outer surface and you can see the prismatic that I pointed out to you in the, in the fib sem. So it's a very thin prismatic layer. And on the inside, you really see almost no structure. You don't see those, those thin elongated aragonite crystals yet. And what you do see is here and there a hint of spheres, but not very clear. So we don't know what this is. But we, and that's why we need spectroscopy to, to analyze it. So now let's go to the next slide. And this is a little bit more information about um, spectroscopy. And we have a fantastically good um, uh, investigate scientist here, Ido Pinkas, whose picture is shown, who is a real Raman expert. And it was really thanks to him that this we could use this approach. But um, the, the way Raman works is that you basically have a laser which activates the electrons and pushes them into higher energy levels, and then they drop down and emit um, photons, and that's what you measure. So it's a, an emission type of, of, an act, of um, spectrum, spectroscopy after activation with a high energy laser. But uh, what you can see here is that geological aragonite has a very rich spectrum with nice sharp peaks, which <clears throat> reflect the fact when you have such sharp, thin peaks that it's highly ordered at the atomic level. And if you compare that on the right-hand side to synthetic amorphous calcium carbonate, which has no long-range atomic order, you can see that you still have a, 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 a major peak of 1079 wave numbers. It's rather broad. And then you don't have any of those other small um, peaks on the left-hand side. And that indicates that it's a very disordered material. So you can see that Raman can provide information on what forms first. Is it a precursor, um, disordered precursor phase or not? Okay. Everybody got that? So let's go to the next slide. Yeah. yeah. Somebody wanted to ask a question? No? Yes, I would like to ask you if uh, this uh, techniques is uh, applicable for uh, fish or light. Absolutely. Uh, did you ever apply it in uh, fish or light? No, never. Ah, it's, uh, yeah. and, Don't uh, you it tested in uh, in autolite chemistry? Yeah, you it's a, you know there's. That's a good idea because the otoliths uh, form continuously, so you should be able to just uh, kill the fish, extract the otoliths, yes. and do the experiment. It would be a beautiful experiment. You can add a comment. Yeah. So uh, really, Ido is uh, he's, uh, he's working with some otolites that I provide him from one of our students, which is uh, Quincia Palazzo. So he's working on autolites too. Who, Ido is working on autolites? Yeah, I gave him samples. Ah, okay. Well, good for him, good for you. Great idea. By the way, if you mention fish, um, it's been published that in the intestine of the fish, <clears throat> there's a lot of mineral, calcium carbonate mineral phase formed. And uh, there's been several publications um, where people thought that this, in fact, fish was another major producer of calcium carbonate in the oceans because their intestines are filled with calcium carbonate. And um, they, in these publications, they said that this material was disordered calcite. <clears throat> and uh, quite a few years ago, I worked with a student who was, who was at the marine lab in Eilat and uh, she um, 
brought some fish from Elat that she just kept caught, and she killed them, and she extracted the material and brought it to the Weizmann Institute, and we analyzed it then by infrared spectroscopy. And we found, yeah, it is disordered calcite. And I said to her, but how do we know that between the time that you killed the fish and you got to the Weizmann Institute that it didn't crystallize? So the long and the short of it is that she brought the fish live to, to the Weizmann Institute and we killed them here and we analyzed them within minutes and it was all these the intestinal calcium carbonate was amorphous calcium carbonate. And by the time it exits the, the intestine and the fish excretes it, it's already started crystallizing. So that's an extreme example of within almost minutes, this material crystallizes, but the first formed precipitate was amorphous. And uh, so it doesn't have any, I think it doesn't have any um, relevance to, um, to the calcium carbonate cycle in the ocean because it's just going to dissolve immediately once the fish excretes it. Okay, so let's get back to, to pteropods. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so a few points about Raman spectroscopy that I didn't mention yet. I mentioned, I said that this is a confocal microscope. So maybe not everybody knows what a confocal microscope is, but it's a wonderful invention because the, the, what you see in the image of a confocal microscope as opposed to a normal optical microscope is only the volume that is in focus. So you have to, in order to get an image, you have to scan your sample um, like in, um, in, across the, uh, the, the, the area that you're interested in. And then you change the focus and then you can go down and, and scan the next plane and the next plane. So with confocal microscopy, you can produce a three-dimensional image. And that's why it's very, very popular in, in biological um, microscopy. But with the, with the confocal Raman microscope, you can get three-dimensional information on the atomic order. So, and the volume um, that you're, from which you're getting the information is about a micron. Okay, that's what I wrote there. Raman depth of field is one micron in relation to the experimental optical setting. So if you go to the growing edge, which is only 300 nanometers thick, that's <clears throat> three times smaller than a micron, you, you can, if you focus on the edge, you'll get information from the whole edge. However, if you go to the protocom, where it's in this, in our, in our um, pteropod, it's 14 microns thick, we can go through the whole, from the surface, to the bay, to the inside, the outer surface, to the inside surface, and obtain information on the atomic order. So I'm going to show you results from from both the growing edge and from the um, the the older shell. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. So this is entitled "In Vivo Micro Raman Spectroscopy Results." Okay. So yes. on the yeah, we put there. Good. So on the top, you see um, a very small uh, specimen of uh, Criseus acicular, and in the bottom is the data for an adult. But we're still only looking. Well, we're looking at the growing edge, which are the spectra in blue. The red is a, are the spectra from the middle, which are is the material has been around for a lot longer. The mineral. And the bottom is the prot is the oldest material, the green. Okay, so if you just look now closely at the um, it's the previous slide, um, yeah, yeah, you you can see okay. that. Okay, okay, yes. So you can see that in the the blue, the growing edge on the left hand side, you can hardly see any peaks, and this is this is magnified on the right-hand side, just the area from 100 to 300 wave numbers is magnified on the right-hand side. So you can see 
that in the blue, it's also, there are almost no peaks. You can also see that we've had to expand the spectrum and that's why it's so noisy. But when you go to the red and to the green, you can see distinct peaks. So in other words, the, 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 the growing edge mineral is highly disordered compared to the older material. Okay? The, mm -hmm. and, you see, and you see the same thing on the adult because the adult is also continuously growing. If you go to the growing edge, you see some spectra which are disordered and some which are beginning to have peaks because we didn't catch it fast enough. And then the, the, the other spectra are much more crystalline. So here is the proof that the first formed crystals at the growing edge are highly disordered, as opposed to the older material that's been in the, uh, that the animal deposited uh, long before that. So it's a very difficult experiment to do. But it, and in this case, we never could find an area between 100 and 300 wave numbers where we didn't have any broad peaks at all. So we could not prove in this way that it really is amorphous calcium carbonate where you don't have any on the left-hand side there. And we could only say that the, the, the material is a highly disordered um, phase of aragonite. And we were very careful in the, in the, in the publication to differentiate between that. And we think it's, it's a problem of, of the measurement uh, because it is so challenging. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. In this slide, what we did was we took the ratio in order to compare many, many different um, spectra from um, and plot them all on the same graph. We took the ratio of two of those small peaks on the left-hand side of the spectrum, the one at 205 and the one at um, 180. And this is just a ratio because the, the higher the ratio, the more crystalline the material is, the peaks have developed, okay? Is that clear to everybody? Okay, yes. so, so when you go to, when you look at this, you can see the range from the growing edge where the peaks are hardly distinguishable with a very low ratio. You go to the middle of the, of the shell, the ratio gets higher. You go to the protocomp, the oldest material, and the ratio gets higher. And most important, have a look at geological aragonite. It's always more crystalline than any of the, the biologically formed um, aragonite in the case of the pteropods. So the pteropod aragonite is more is disordered than geological aragonite and hence more soluble than geological aragonite. So in other words, if somebody would have done a Peterson experiment by suspending geological aragonite in the ocean, he would have got a different result if he would have used pteropod shells as opposed to geological aragonite. They would have dissolved much more, more quickly. I don't know about much mm -hmm. more, but they would, are more soluble than geological aragonite, okay? And that's a very important observation because when you're trying, and I'm going to come back to it, I'll come back to it at the end of the talk, which is close, which is soon. Okay, next slide. By the way, I, yeah, sorry, I didn't show the results, but when you go, when you go through using the confocality in, in the older part, you can see that the inner shell surface, the inner shell, um, surface is disordered compared to the outer shell. In other words, this proves that pteropods are thickening their shells and elongating their shells simultaneously. But that's a small point. And in this slide, which is almost at the end, I took out from my bookshelf a book that I inherited from Heinz Lowenstam, which is the classic oceanography book by Sverdrup, Johnson and Fleming, 1942. And it's a beautiful book. And I copied this part of this image that they have there of the distribution of the different types of sediments 
And um, I focus on the Pacific, but it's for the whole world. And uh, what you can see here is um, the distribution that they knew of at that time of um, red clay, which means that, um, sorry, red clay, uh, sediments which are rich in foraminifera, which they call globigerina, and sediments which contain pteropods. If you look at the key to the, the distribution, and then sediments which don't have any calcium carbonate in them, but are rich still in radiolarians and diatoms, which form siliceous sediments. Okay? And if you look for um, where you have foraminifera in the sediments, you can see almost in many different places. If you look where you don't have foraminifera um, and where you have the radiolarians and the diatoms, you can see the northern Pacific uh, is like that. And that means that the, that the calcium carbonate has dissolved. And what's left is just the siliceous uh, material or just red, red clay. And if you look for where the pteropods are, you can't find them, basically. And um, whereas the Peterson experiment, which I've shown again on the left-hand side, would have predicted that all the sediments that are below um, 3,000 meters or even one kilometer where aragonite is supersaturated should have pteropods in their sediments. And in fact, pteropods are really underrepresented in the analyses of deep sea sediments. And this was already concluded by a very famous geochemist by the name of Berner in 1979. And I I quote here what he said. Um, I have concluded that roughly half of the mass of calcium carbonate falling to the bottom of the earth consists of aragonite. In other words, half of the stuff that's falling down is pteropods. And almost all of this aragonite is dissolved along the way. And pteropods are big compared to, to the foraminifera and so on, but they've dissolved. And in, and in my opinion, the answer to what, to, or, to, or part of the answer to what Berner observed in 1979 is that it's not geological aragonite falling down um, through, the, through, the, through the water, but it is a highly disordered form of biologically formed aragonite, the pteropod aragonite, and this dissolves very, very quickly. So, I think that you can appreciate that we start out with dealing with um, with atoms and atomic order, and it sounds very, very um, sort of what's the relevance of this? So we characterize the atomic disorder or the atomic order of pteropod aragonite. So what? Well, that's what I wanted. The message that I wanted to to sort of to leave you with, and that is that, yeah, from a very specific question. It has, it can have very broad implications to understanding deep sea sediments of, on the ocean. And, the, and from that also to the preservation of the record of deep sea sediments when you take cores um, through the sediments and you ask questions about past um, seawater chemistry. And that same, and the same comment I'll make about, pater about foraminifera and coccolis, but foraminifera in particular, we know that their shells are pretty disordered, calcite. And the question is, what happened, <clears throat> how does that influence this map of sphere draw? <coughs> it's not really Hetterson's spheres of inorganic geological or calcite uh, that's relevant here, but this is biological calcite and it's not the same as geological calcite, okay? So let's go. Um, well, let's, that's just what I've, I just wrote down what I concluded. But let me read it. Um, does this distribution in sphere drop, of course, it reflects in part where the foraminifera and the pteropods live in the surface oceans. You're not going to find them in the bottom if they don't live at the top. But basically, these groups of organisms live almost everywhere. 
areas where they do not dissolve as they fall to the bottom of the ocean. Why don't they dissolve? Um, or, and that is because maybe they dissolve along the way as they're falling down. And does this distribution in the sediments reflect where seawater is saturated? That's what they thought in the past. No, it's not correct. It's not geological aragonite that's respect, uh, sat, that seawater is respect, uh, saturated with respect to. It's biological aragonite, which is not the same. And so we really need to know as much as possible about biological mineral formation uh, before we can start extrapolating. So the final side is the conclusions, just to wrap it up. What I showed you in the first part of the talk is that the microstructure of the Cavalonida uh, shell is not helical, but is composed of nested arrays of S-shaped aragonite fibers. Sorry. No, I was reading the, the quest that was my quest. <laughs> Okay, and I think here, this, this has um, implications to understanding how the pteropods have adapted the shells to be both lightweight and mechanically tough so that they still get protection, but they don't have to keep a very heavy shell um, in suspension in the water and expend a lot of energy. So this solution may be very interesting to uh, people interested in being developing new materials and being inspired by a biological material. And so I think, and, and there are a lot of materials chemists and material scientists who, who look to biology for inspiration. And I think this is going to um, hopefully inspire them. Uh, the results that I reported, I told you about, are now being reviewed in a paper that we submitted for publication. For for publication. Uh, the second conclusion is that pteropod aragonite forms via a nascent disordered precursor phase of aragonite. And the third point is that aragonite of adult pteropod shells is not as ordered as geological aragonite and is therefore more soluble. And I've gone through what are the implications of this. All right, that's my talk. So I'm glad to discuss um, any you. questions that you have or other questions that you might have? Uh, Steve, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this pattern, I have an echo, so it's a bit disturbed, beaming me. Okay, and I try to talk. This pattern from the growing edge to the proto protocol. Yeah. that show an increasing in order. Right. It, it's more uh, depending on the biologic, biological control of the growth or there is, um, uh, is, or is this prevalent uh, chemistry reaction or, or abiotic, yeah. abiotic effect? Well, I think what we did in the beginning is we didn't, uh, at the beginning of that, um, of that research project, we didn't go to the trouble of analyzing in the, in the Raman living animals. We actually anesthetized them and kept them alive on ice in the microscope. But when we didn't do that, the growing edge was already more crystalline. So in other words, it's not the biology which is stabilizing the, origin, the first formed phase, but once precipitated, it's going to spontaneously crystallize, whether the animal is alive or dead. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. We... Other comments, questions? Can I ask a question? Sure. Is it possible that the, the climate change um, could affect the a structure of the crystal, I mean, uh, um, is it possible that the decrease of the pH of the ocean could uh, trigger uh, a change of the um, uh, of these uh, pteropods in order to uh, decrease the solubility of calcium 
of, of the shell structure that I assume that maybe should uh, increase uh, with a decrease of the pH. I don't know if the uh, yeah, that's right. Look, that's that's a question which I know um, in in Bologna you're investigating great detail and and many of the many people around the world address this question and there are papers published on pteropods predicting that as as the seawater acidifies in the future or more that pteropods um, are going to their shells will dissolve and they won't be able to live my personal opinion is that that is not a, that is not the right experiment to perform you can't take an animal which is is adapted to living in ph 8.2 and put it into pH 8 or 7 or 7.9 or 7.8 and think that the adaptation that is immediate when you transfer a, a marine animal like that into a different environment is going to reflect what will happen over a long period of time of, of tens of years. And that's why I think that the work that Giuseppe did on the CO2 vent um, in the south of Italy, off the coast of the south of Italy, is far more relevant, and that is to have a look at how those animals adapted over tens and tens of years to a pH drop, and not to do an experiment in a tank, which many people do throughout the world, and uh, in my opinion, spend a lot of, or waste a lot of uh, good research funds to do those experiments on sick animals. But my feeling is that marine organisms in general do not they they're manipulating seawater and if this if the change of ph um, is not going to is not going to greatly affect or directly affect their ability to make um, shells i mean after all they 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 manipulate the ph once they've taken up seawater which is actually a very common way to to build shells by the way we didn't realize that until fairly recently with the work of Jonathan Eres on uh, foraminifera and then sea urchins and, and other groups that one, a common way to take up ions is to actually just swallow seawater and then the organisms start manipulating that seawater. And so they know how to manipulate seawater. And as the seawater changes, my feeling is that the Darwinian evolution is going to give the benefit to those mutants which know how to deal with lower acidic uh, conditions and they'll thrive and the other ones will die. That's uh, Darwinian evolution. And I think uh, marine organisms can adapt very quickly because of their reproductive strategy. So I'm not as concerned about, about this particular issue with regard to uh, shell formation uh, and ocean acidity as many people are. I would love to have a Good discussion about that. Somebody, I hope somebody disagrees with me. Anybody? Well, I, I just don't know anything about this. So I study completely different topics. So <laughs> thank you anyway. Yeah. Giuseppe, what do you think about? Uh, can you do those experiments? Are they relevant? Yeah, I, I want to say that we run this experiment, me and Stefano, and uh, Stefano is really the king of uh, the CO2 vents, because he's one that collects and analyzes all the sample there. I work more in the lab. But yeah. In any case, I completely agree with you that uh, these are the relevant experiments. The organisms have to spend several life cycles in the same environment to adapt to this condition. Uh, I have a different question for you, St uh, Steve. Yeah, yeah, maybe I, Stefano is good too. I, Stefano, Stefano, you can add a comment. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no. Maybe. No, uh, I, I I agree with uh, with Steve, uh, and uh, there are several short-term experiments that, uh, to me, to what is my experience, are not really relevant. It's much uh, more uh, accurate uh, to make a prediction on, uh, on population that actually living in a natural environment for all their life, like the one uh, we studied in the vents, because the yeah. 
you can really there understand if they can acclimate, if not adapt, but at least uh, you may try to understand what are the acclimation process in the in the natural population. Right. And we also actually found very different response in classification rates in zooxanthellate corals in the vents uh, between short-term experiments uh, manipulative experiments and the actual response of natural population living along the gradient. So, when you run experiment in the tank, uh, you need you really need to be careful of uh, ex extrapolation of the meaning of the experiments. And um, so, there is a quincia. I see a students that want to say to say something. Sure. She raised yeah. her hands. Please. Hello. Hi, first of all, uh, thank you for this interesting lecture. I have a question about um, the environment and in particular the depth distribution. So how the water pressure can have an influence on the biomineralization process. I mean, uh, therapods are um, pelagic animals, so can do vertical migration uh, during the day. So do you think that um, water pressure can have an impact on the uh, biomediation process? And yeah. in which case, how? Thank you. Yeah. That's, a, that's a fascinating question. Uh, if you see behind me on, on the shelf over here, there is a book which, which uh, I inherited from Lowenstein. Um, and because it's a, it is, it's a whole book devoted to the possible effects of hydrostatic, <coughs> hydrostatic pressure on biology in the ocean, on organisms in the oceans. And Lowenstam, in order to, already in the 1960s at Caltech, he built high pressure aquaria. In other words, he could, he, he succeeded or the engineers succeeded in flowing seawater through an aquarium and when it got into the aquarium, it was under high pressure, which is not a simple thing to do. And so he was growing deep sea um, animals in his aquaria at Caltech in order to investigate the effect of high pressure. And Lowenstam himself um, spent a lot of effort to try to find a hydrostatic effect so that paleontologists could reconstruct the past the depth of the oceans based on a recorded high pressure effect. And the bottom line is that it doesn't seem to be that, that important or it's not recorded by biology. And I think um, this is evidenced also by the fact that we now know that many of the, of the um, animals at least that, that invaded the deep sea and got to deep sea vents, but invaded the deep sea were actually shallow water evolved in the shallow waters and then invaded the deep sea. And my, I, I'm not sure about this, but I think the reason is that at great depths, unless you are like a nautilus, which, in, which has air or gas inside its shell, when you, you don't feel the pressure as, because you have water inside it at the same pressure as outside. So it doesn't seem to affect enzymes or metabolic processes as much as people thought it would or should. That's that's my understanding of it. What do you think about that? Well, I I think that um, maybe it could have an influence on the fluidity. Um, maybe the enzyme inside, but if there are physiological uh, control, maybe this is not affected so much yeah yeah maybe you are right <laughs> i don't know I, it's a you know as, as i showed you in my answer it's a question which is which in the 1960s not marine but it's yeah, really since then i don't think i think people just come to the country that it's really not such a big effect okay thank you Okay. Another question I think somebody had. Um, maybe I can ask a question. Please. My name is 
Lisette Mekkes and I'm a PhD researcher at uh, Naturalis Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands. Oh. I'm working actually on pteropods. And yeah. I am very, very happy to be able to join the seminar because I've read a lot about your work and also mm -hmm. the work you, you just um, showed here. It is really interesting. And also your perspective on ocean education is very uh, interesting in terms of uh, pteropods because, you know, everyone thinks pteropods are going to be the first ones who are going to die with ocean education. They will be affected first. And you may be one of the first people I actually hear saying like, well, let's see if that's actually going to happen. So um, I just had a bit of a question because today I actually have a paper that is published on a short term experiment that I did with Limacina retroversa in the subantarctic. And uh, we exposed them to more, um, how to say, more realistic levels of PCO2 than the most extreme levels that, that other people normally do, you know, mm -hmm. um, to um, also in, how to say, to, to reduce the impact of the captivity effects. So what we found is that they actually relocate their calcification. So based on calcium integration, we found that in already present day and near future conditions, these theropods are growing more on their outer edge, whereas in uh, past conditions where aragonite is also more available, these shells are growing over their entire shell. So not only making their shells larger, but also making their shells thicker. So um, we could only see this based on uh, calcium integration, of course, and we also even made um, slices of the shells to see how it is uh, calcium integrated. And I can share you my paper today if you like. But yeah. um, what I would be very interested, I, I am not the one who would say like pteropods are the first one to die, because I also like to think that evolution has a very important role in, um, in how they will be affected. Um, but how would you maybe explain this re relocation of calcification in uh, what we have seen? Do you think that is that they are able to actually make a choice? Like, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna invest in becoming larger rather than also thicker or yeah. I was well, wondering who would think about that. Yeah, I think we're you're, you're calling it calcification, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't think it's that that it's necessarily calcification. Basically, I would translate your observations into the fact that under these new conditions, they are elongating the shell edge faster than they are. Do you understand? Do you understand? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think you fall away a little bit. Excuse me? My Sorry, I, yeah, I, I think the okay. connection... I'll repeat what I said. Yes, please. My interpretation of your observations would be that what you're showing is that under the new conditions of growth, these those animals, the limitinas, are elongating their shell edge, or they're adding more, they're, they're, more, they're rapidly adding to the shell edge then they are thickening. So the balance between um, between enlarging their shells and thickening their shells has been disrupted by the change in conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's a cellular response. It's not necessarily has anything to do with calcification. Oh, it's just, that's interesting. It's, and, and this type of observation has been mixed up over the whole history of, of of people studying this. And it started out in the 1960s, 70s, when uh, people noticed that they, they measured aragonite and calcite in various uh, mollusks, um, you know, like the uh, mitilus, the mitilus, mm -hmm. the blue, blue mussel. Um, and they noticed that in warmer waters, there's more aragonite than in colder waters. And they said, oh, aragonite, is more stable in warmer waters and colder waters, and they 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 measured aragonite and calcite. That was that. But what they were actually saying was that the shell, the the layers of the shell, um, changed their relative proportions, 
and it had nothing to do directly with aragonite and calcite. It had to do with the way the cells were making those shells. And and that's what I would I would think that that's more what you're what you're showing here. I don't know if they're which one is out of proportion, whether they're thickening more slowly than elongating or the other way around. But it's mm -hmm. that I would view it. Wow, this is a really nice um, nice view on this. Um, so what do you exactly mean with a cellular response? Well, there's cells that, I mean, the cells that are responsible for, for making the shell, um, they have to do, they have to build the shell. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're, I mean, we spend a lot of time in our groups studying the, 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 the pathways by which ions are taken up from the seawater, go through the cells, and eventually are deposited. And this is an extremely complex, well-controlled physiological process. Mm -hmm. Many, many different steps. And if you interrupt, you, you, you know, if the CO2 pressure changes one of them, then you're going to get the the, out, the 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 output of that effect is going to manifest itself in in relative proportions of different layers. So, mm -hmm. I think it's 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 too too sort of simple to just correlate this with calcification or mineralization, biomineralization. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, it might yeah. be to do carbonic anhydrase, not you know moving. CO2 fast enough into the CO the carbonate phase, but it may not. It may be that uh, something else is happening along this complex pathway, and these cells just don't function the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, you're carrying on a long tradition for pteropod research in Holland. <laughs> Well, I think I don't think there is a lot of pteropods research. Um, well, on the calcification, at least on their uh, growth shell growth, there's not a lot of research. But um, yeah, it's building up now, so that's nice. Well, I, I just reached up onto my bookshelf. Oh yeah, Ari Janssen, of course. No, no, this is um, Van der Spool. Oh, Van der Spool, yeah, the first Van der one. Yeah, I yeah. grew up in South Africa, so I should have pronounced his name better than that. <laughs> no, that was really good. 1967, he wrote the textbook on um, on pteropods. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, um, I would be very happy um, to share my paper with you and maybe even talk a bit more about this kind of research because I'm very intrigued by your uh, perspective and all your knowledge on this subject. Okay, I'm glad to. That's fine. So send me the paper and let's set up a conversation. Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, so I want to say that uh, <laughs> together with uh, Giuseppe, Eric, Fiorella and the other guys from Bologna, we studied, uh, as we said before, the mineralization, biomineralization, calcification response of corals along the PhD gradient. And we saw something uh, kind of... Um, a trade-off or, let's say, different uh, response of uh, skeletal growth in different pH conditions, where in more acidic side, we found that the corals maintain uh, the polyps of the corals. Coral polyps maintain the linear extension rate uh, at the expense of the porosity. So we found that... Uh, the extension rate, so the size of the corals along the gradient is the same, but the, the coral skeletons become uh, increase their porosity, more acidified uh, condition. And uh, we uh, explain this um, mechanism through an hypothesis. We explain and our hypothesis is this is actually a biological control to the cellular response of the calicoblastic cells that uh, are uh, the, the, that uh, decrease their activity or even they become inactivated in a, in a more acidic uh, condition because the higher energy that they need to to to, to calcify in their condition so the number of calico our to our hypothesis the number of calicoblastic cells 
uh, that are actually active in the more acidic condition are, are, are decreasing in number. So it's a kind of a biological response uh, yeah. of the skeleton. It's not just a dissolution. It's a, it's a different uh, cellular activity in, in, in the more acidic condition. Yeah, well, that's along the same, the same line of thinking as what I was just saying. Exactly. Um, and, and that's why... Um, you know, we're Leah and I are focusing a lot of attention on understanding the the, the pathways of of mineralization, and uh, and and I think that's the heart of the issue here. We really have to understand the cells. Mm -hmm. so we're using, for example, cryofib sem to you know, and we're trying to integrate chemical analysis into cryofib sem to better understand this whole process and. Um, and uh, it's a biological, it's a challenging biological problem. So, <coughs> yeah, uh, hi, can I make a, a last question, maybe? Please. Yeah, so I'm Paula Ramshilva, I work at Naturalis, I'm actually a colleague of uh, Lisette, and I was very pleased with your presentation, Steve, congratulations. Yeah. I'm also working on uh, pteropods and uh, shell diversity and evolution and I'm very interested in this group and I wanted to ask you if you think that these uh, uh, curved crystals were somehow generated from this crossed lamellar yeah. structure is more common yeah. or how did it emerge yeah well or I mean I think if you have any thoughts yeah, yeah, we're in even in the paper that we submitted for publication in the discussion, we just pointed out that the the basic crystal is the same, elongated, aragonite, about the same dimensions, and so on. So the adaptation um, in the covalents is just basically to to curve that, and and that's a growth process. Yeah, I think I, my guess would be I have no proof at all that um, mm -hmm. that it's an adaptation of the cross lamella structure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I, I think from my observations, looking at uh, at what uh, at the group and uh, at the members of uh, different species. Uh, I, I would say that that is the most likely uh, event. Uh, although uh, there are some old papers in grey literature that mention that these curved crystals could appear in the protoconch of other uh, mollusk species. They have Not seen really. it in, uh, yeah, in Aplysia, I think. They also found it in heteropods that are uh, another group of planktonic gastropods. Mm. Their same images are not very conclusive either. So, yeah. um, so it may be that actually this structure is, uh, uh, is also in other groups. We just haven't looked uh, yeah. thoroughly in other Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I think that you know, once you usually point these things out, that that's that's the element. It's the curved crystals. It's not this, this hypoth hypothetical helix itself that that characterizes it. Mm -hmm. Then I think, yeah, it's a small adaptation in a, in many respects. Um, so it's not such a big deal. But um, well, what do you think of the of the fact that this is not a helical structure, or did you assume? Uh, did, I, I don't know. Well, I read other works and, and there were uh, um, at least two papers uh, that uh, showed, uh, that tried to show that is an helical structure and I was quite convinced by them. Yeah, there are about five, five, all the papers on Pterapod. Yeah, so there is this first one from 72 by Be, but then there is another one from 2011, some Zhang, and I think there they, they show it. So I was convinced that uh, uh, from their data that it was an helical structure. Yeah. And then they, they use different species. So Crisase, uh, 
it doesn't have a lot of uh, turns. And if you look at Cuvierina or yeah. at, uh, the Acrias, they, they have a more complex structure, or at least they have they seem to have more layers of these curved crystals. Uh, yeah, that's and the, the, Zang, the, the, the history of the Zhang paper is that the senior author of that paper is Yurong Ma, and she was a postdoc in our group um, for a couple of years. And when she went back to China, she, we, she talked to me about what possible subjects we can talk about, she can study. So I, I have um, a, a bottle much bigger than this, which is full of um, diacrea. Mm -hmm. I went found them, I went found them they'd washed up on the, the shells had washed up on the beach in Elat. So I gave her a a, a bottle of diacrea shells and that's that's why she did that's the, the, the origin of that study. Mm -hmm. But if we would have just done scanning electron microscopy and x-ray diffraction, uh, we would not have any evidence to to say that it's not helical. But on the other hand, if you read all the literature, nobody ever saw a whole helix. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why we feel fairly confident that, that the solution is actually this S-shaped arrays and not helical structure. But uh, somebody might prove us wrong. Yeah, let's see. Okay, looking forward for your uh, uh, publication. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Steve. Still, can I ask the last question? Please. You Many people that, can ask the last question. <laughs> you say that this uh, S-shaped structure is a single crystal, or understood, if I understood well. No, the, the sing, even, the, even the, the single S-shaped crystal um, uh, even is not a, sing, it's, it's, it's okay, not a single crystal. Um, Antonio Checa did a beautiful study of um, the crystallography of those uh, spaghetti-shaped single, so-called single crystals. And he found that they're actually able to curve because of the twinning planes um, alternating. Oh, great. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, it's, it's not trivial that it's just curved, uh, but it, is a, it, it has the characteristics of a single crystal. Um, but the little segments seem to be um, changed direction because of a twinning plane. Thanks. Yeah. Another question, Steve. Uh, yeah. You say that this, uh, the aragonite is, uh, is more disordered. Right. Be the, but the percentage of organic metrics is about 0.01%. Right. So this disorder should be associated probably to, to some uh, other ions. Did you find some strange... Elemental composition in this aragonite. No, I think I mean I don't I don't know I don't know the reason for the disorder. But uh, the first thing was to prove that it's that the initial phase is disordered, and then I presume it's because it didn't get it didn't completely crystallize because of the presence of of other phases, other ions or other proteins or something. No, I don't I don't know the the reason. I mean I don't know how they produce the disordered phase and and how it's how it crystallizes yeah that's that's we need to know these are isn't it terribly important group the pterophiles now yeah, because you say the forums in forums the solubility of, of calcite is higher because there is a lot of magnesium is magnesium calcite with well, high not only, magnesium. no not only that it's um it's not just the high magnesium you can have well crystallized high magnesium phases yeah it crystal in domain a lot of parameters but I would like yeah. to know if there is some other ions that can be involved during this process. Yeah, I mean everything that that disturbs the the the, the crystallization process can interfere and 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 uh, induce disorder to to be to you know during formation and 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 preservation. Yeah, there are many reasons, there are many ways to do that. Um, uh, we've we've um, done some work which we haven't published on, the, you know, using infrared grinding curves. You probably know about that. Yeah, method. this was my third question. You can so, show my. No. Yeah, so we've done a lot of a lot of work on on living foraminifera that we collected at in Elat, but 
we've never published it because it's in it, but it, the bottom line there is it looks like there's a, a, an amorphous calcium carbonate phase even in the mature um, foraminiferal shells. But uh, it's, it's, I'm not 100% sure, but it's certainly, it's, it's, it's really something's going on with foraminifera that's, that's not expected. Okay, thanks, Steve. Okay. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, I maybe have the last question. I Hi. see this uh, this uh, beautiful pictures in the garden of Weizmann Institute. The last uh, the last uh, slide, your your oh. Nolan's slide, if you put it. Yeah. Yeah, you are in the Weizmann garden, I guess. Yeah, we're standing yes. somewhere. Yeah, it's so. just outside our building. But, uh, I should have so, shown the slide because that shows uh, Odelia in her in the group. Yes, yeah. yes I have a question. Now, this uh, is this bottle, nice bottle uh, in front of us, uh, an Italian spumante bottle of wine. <laughs> well, that's a very important. That's a very important question. <laughs> but as far as I remember, when it was uh, Spanish cava. <laughs> Maybe what you should ask another question, you should ask if we would have taken that picture today, would everybody be wearing masks? <laughs> well, the question, the answer is they should be wearing masks, but everybody in that picture is probably been vaccinated twice already with the um, Pfizer vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a different world we're living in here in Israel right now. Yeah. But, um, but still, people are very afraid because of the variants and so on. And so we're very cautious about uh, feeling too confident that we're protected. Uh, in fact, it's clear that we're not, not as well protected as we would like to be. No, so, here we are still far away from the green passport. Yeah, well, I can show you, I can show you my green passport. It's in my pocket. But I don't believe it's a passport to a lot of, to, to, to very far into the future, I'm afraid, unfortunately. So the world is, Israel somehow jumped ahead of the world just because we have an organized health system. Um, but uh, but uh, it it's, doesn't look very promising that this is going to be the, the, the solution to this horrible pandemic. Yes. Well, on that optimistic note. <laughs> okay, if there are not uh, any other uh, question, uh, 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 I'll leave uh, the, the, the words to Giuseppe, if you want to comment, uh, and then I close the, the seminar, Giuseppe. I'll leave you oh, a few words. There's a question in the chat. There are questions still? Okay, great. The chat? In chat, uh, I, in chat, uh, I need to go. Okay, so there is a, there is a question and they say, please, did you think about the relation between the structure of spiral shell and the straight shell, straight shell? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's what I answered before about, um, I agreed with uh, the person from Holland. Um, yes. That uh, I think evolutionarily, I think they're very, this is, it's a small difference. Um, where the arrays of crystals in the cross lamella are straight and the in the cavallina pteropods they're curved. So I don't think it's such a big deal. Uh, but and I would I would guess that evolutionarily they are related very closely. Okay, I don't see other other question right now. So Giuseppe, if you want to say a few words for closing the the session yes of course i want to thank steve one more once more for the excellent seminar he presented us and the one thing that uh, steve always showed is uh, a reading of the old literature 
So in all his study, in all his presentation, he's showing all the literature. So our students usually don't like to study too much. They usually they go with experiment without know what has been done in the past. I think Steve is gave an excellent, not only for this example, how much is important what has been published in the past and how much is important also to select what has been published in the past. This is, a, I think, a, a general issue, uh, general question and general knowledge that Steve brought up. Thanks for this, Steve. Yeah, Thanks pleasure. also for this. OK, also from my side, I want uh, to thank you, Steve, for uh, for this excellent seminar. I, I think it was a, a great uh, time for our students. We had uh, online more than 50 people so at, at some point, even from abroad and uh, guests from uh, other university and uh, European countries. So thank you very much, Steve. It was for your time and your dedication and I hope next years and the next future we will be able to organize a, a seminar here in presence here with you yeah, in that, Italy. That was our actually that was our uh, idea Giuseppe and my and hi my idea to have you here in Bologna maybe even in Fano we have a, a new center in Fano Fano is a city in the Marche region is a, 160, 160 kilometers south of Bologna in the Adriatic coast is a new center mm. that we are building. It is an inter-institute inter center, okay. uh, similar uh, the, to IUI as an organization because it's joined by the University of Bologna, University of Ancona, University of Urbino, National Research Council and the Stazione uh, zoologic Anton Dorn from Naples. So it's five right. institutes. They are building this uh, this new center. Maybe next year we can organize uh, something there. Let's well, um, I would love to. When you invited me, I was looking forward to coming to visit Bologna again and uh, mm. going out to lunch together. Boy, that would have been good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You are always welcome, Steve. Yeah, well, as soon as it's possible, I would like to come. It'd be wonderful. You are welcome. Sure. All right. Okay. So, thank Thanks you so all much. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Goodbye, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.